The following segments are pre-recorded and sponsored by Longworth Productions. A new strain of COVID on Triad Today. Hello everyone, I'm Jim Longworth and welcome to another edition of Triad Today, coming to you once again from the beautiful Senior Botanical Garden in Kernersville. We'll tell you more about them later on. And later on is when the round table shows up. You don't want to miss that and all the controversies they get into. But between now and then, some great guests, important information coming your way, including a discussion about a new uh, COVID variant, which you want to learn about. We're going to cover a lot of things, and where we want to start is talking about business services, and we do that with someone who knows all about it. He's a first-time visitor to the show. David Swepke is a business services consultant for Guilford Works. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Let's remind folks very quickly what Guilford Works is all about in case they haven't seen it at one of our other shows. Go ahead. Sure, yeah. Guilford Works is one of 20 workforce development boards in the state of North Carolina, and we are responsible for identifying the needs of the, the local workforce, uh, the local job market. Right. And we do that by um, developing and implementing strategies to meet those needs. Right. And I think you said in an email to me, there were three things that stuck out in my mind. You mentioned a one-stop career center. You mentioned yep. a merging workforce center. And you mentioned a next-gen program. We don't, not a lot of detail. Very quickly, just give me a couple of words on each of those. Yeah. So our NC Works career centers, we have two. There's one in Greensboro and one in High Point. And they really uh, focus on the, the job seekers. And they have... Um, dedicated individuals in the centers that work one-on-one -on -one with those job seekers, really just to generally get them work ready. Right. Um, the Emerging Workforce Center is located in downtown Greensboro, and they really focus on our uh, young adult population, so for the age ranges of 16 to 24. All right, and then the next-gen program you're talking about, that's the same thing? That's the same thing. Same thing. Well, I'm, I'm a next-gener. <laughs> I don't know why he's laughing. Uh, so, but in other words, uh, you're, you're not just serving businesses or you know, people that are job seekers, you're really helping both, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, there was a thing you, you were talking to me about off camera with job profiling. Now, tell me more about what you mean by job profiling. Yeah, that's a great question. So ACT job profiling is a process that helps employers identify not only the skills, but the skill levels that are necessary for people to be successful in jobs. So an ACT authorized job profiler will meet with subject matter experts within an organization. And then they'll go through various uh, procedures identifying critical tasks, skills, and competencies uh, for a specific job performance. When everything is all said and done, an individualized report is generated and you know, detailing all, the, all that information. This provides the employer a framework to help identify the best possible candidates. Um, and it can be used for new hires, it can be used for um, current employees and for potential training opportunities. Current employees who maybe want to move up a Absolutely. little bit. Are you seeing any emerging industries and positions in our local area that come to mind? Absolutely. Uh, so currently we are seeing uh, the healthcare and educational sectors um, continue to be strong with hiring, uh, in terms of hiring. We also see that retail and um, uh, the um, food service industry um, continue to grow and higher as well. Of course, I, coming out of COVID, food service trying to, to recover, and, and so now you're seeing that as an emerging thing. Absolutely. Now, do you have any recent successes that you might want to mention? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, we've had several, over the past several months, we've rolled out initiatives that have helped the judicially impacted communities, as well as the immigrant and refugee communities. We've held a third annual um, health care summit to focus on that sector. Uh, we've uh, hosted a um, transportation and logistics hiring event that brought together training providers, employers, and job seekers all in the same room. And then most recently, we had a diversity, equity, and inclusion summit that brought together some of the um, industry leaders in DEI and employers. And it was very interactive where we just had discussions about current topics and best practices. See, I didn't know you had success. What if you'd said, no, Jim, we don't have any successes. <laughs> and we, you know, no, but you do, a lot of them. Yes. And I appreciate what you're doing on that. Up on screen, uh, guilfordworks.org is the main website. But if you also want to check out gearupguilford.org, and ncworks.gov, you can do that. But again, gophardworks.org is the main website. David, I appreciate what you're doing to help uh, get folks into the workforce and work with business. Thanks for everything. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back after this. Need help buying food? 
everyone needs help sometimes. Food and Nutrition Services may be able to help you buy food and free up your money for other expenses, such as utilities and medicine. To receive FNS assistance, households must meet income limits. You may be able to get assistance even if you own a home, car, land, property, or have a retirement plan or money in the bank. Second Harvest Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina team members can help you with the application process over the phone. To receive help or if you have any questions, call 336-422-7758. Hi, I'm Jim Longworth reminding you that Try It Today is now streaming on WFMY Plus, available free on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. Back now on Try It Today, and let's talk about family services with two folks who know all about it on my immediate right. Of course, Crystal Harden, she's Assistant Director of Family Services for Social Workers at Mountain Valley Hospice and Palliative Care. And uh, with her is her partner, uh, Brian Chilton. He's Assistant Director of Family Services for Chaplains and Bereavement. We welcome both of you. Thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Crystal, I'm going to start with you. What kind of professionals comprise the family services team at Mountain Valley? I mean, who's involved? So that would be our social workers, our chaplains, and our bereavement staff. And they, they all sort of work together and interface, so it's not like, you know, I mean, they, they compare notes and, and you feel like uh, they're really helping people better that way, right? They are. They are. It's really kind of a team effort. They all work together um, along with our other staff, our nurses and our CNAs. They all work together as a team right. to serve our patients and families. Now, in general, what do family services entail? I mean, what kind of services and resources are you offering? What are we talking about? Give me, give me some examples. So our social workers primarily, they're able able to provide um, resources in the community. They're able to do things like health care power of attorneys. Um, that's important. Yeah, that's very important. Um, they're able to provide those services such as uh, placement services if needed. They're able to help families find other resources such as Meals on Wheels, things like that that help our families and um, patients. In, in their time of need. Yeah, I, I've been there and, and with, with my parents, and I know that you're already stressed out and there's a lot going on, and, and the help of the social workers is really important. It is. Uh, Brian, let me switch to you for a minute. What are the main goals of chaplains and bereavement coordinators when you're talking about providing care? What's their role? I would summarize that with two words, um, hope and cope. I think the first, one of the most important things is to identify a person's hope, uh, that is their source of strength. For some people that may be their faith, uh, for other people that may be family, friends, relationships they have. Uh, sometimes it may be a person's job, occupation. Uh, for some people it may be a hobby. Uh, hunting and fishing are two big uh, activities that are popular in our area. Some people find comfort in golf. Personally, it's more of a stressor <laughs> yeah, source of comfort for yeah, me. If you don't know how to play it. Exactly. But, so uh, it's, a per, it's a real personalized thing, the way you describe it. Yes, sir. It sure is. And everyone's different. Everyone handles grief um, and stressors in life differently. And so our job as uh, chaplains uh, are to come in and try to connect a person with their source of hope. And while doing so, uh, also help that person cope. I think it was Viktor Frankl who said that if um, in a man's search for meaning, that if uh, well, you, can, you can endure most anything if you find that connection to what gives you strength. And so I think that's one of the things that we as chaplains strive to do, uh, connect them again to that source of hope and while doing so, empower them to be able to cope in their time of need. Now, can, can everyone benefit from these kind of services, do you think? Absolutely, most assuredly. You know, one of the common misconceptions is that chaplaincy is only for religious people. But I'll be honest, some of the best visits I've had have been with people who weren't necessarily religious. Right. Um, quite honestly, we normally lead with curiosity. I think uh, if you're kind of a historian, you kind of approach it in that fashion. They really make some good visits to learn more about that person, what they're going through, and the situations they're facing. Uh, after a loved one passes away, are, are all these resources y'all are talking about available to families right away very quickly? I mean, give me an idea of that. They are. We provide bereavement services for 13 months after passing, and those are also available to our community as well. Um, so we provide community services. We also have uh, support groups that we provide to our communities as well as to our families. It's so important. To just, it is. I, I think that's great. You said 13 months because you know, everybody has a, you said, a different grieving process and can go exactly. on for different lengths. Of time. I just think that's great what you're, what you're doing, what you're offering. Up on screen, uh, mtnvalleyhospice.org, or you can call 888-789-2922. 
And I just thank both of you so much for what you're doing to make things just a little bit easier for those who are grieving. Thanks a lot. Everybody. Thank you. We'll be right back after this. My mother passed away on a Monday night. My dad and I were with her. What would have been a dreadful experience at home was a blessing at the Waltz Hospice home in Dobson. Mama was safe and comfortable. So were we. We were even able to bring our dog Gracie for a visit. From their in-home care to their hospice homes to helping us after she was gone. The people at Mountain Valley Hospice made us better people and became family. Back now on Try Today, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about COVID. Wait a minute, don't get nervous. We're sort of coming out of the pandemic itself, but there's a new strain of COVID, I understand, that we want to learn more about, and we have an expert in the field that's going to help us with that. Dr. Missy Jackson is uh, with uh, Novant Health Union Cross Family Medicine in Kernersville. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, COVID hasn't been in the news a lot this summer, but what can you tell us about or warn us about as far as this fall coming up? Well, that is true, Jim. Um, COVID has not been in the media as of late, but there has been an uptick of COVID cases. I've actually seen some at my office, um, and there's been an uptick of hospitalizations as well. That's not good, uh, but I guess also what I want to ask you about, and we've sort of teased it in the show up to now, is this new variant or new strain of, of COVID, and I think you sent me an email, and it's E-R-I-S. Iris, Co Iris, yeah. That's the um, layman's representation of it. It's actually a subvariant of the Omicron called EG.5. And yes, that is a new variant um, that is out. And it's actually um, the most prevalent and was in the United States um, this August. Well, now for the variant, is it, is, should folks go get boosters or shots or whatever for that? Or does it, is there anything out there for it? Or what? what's your recommendation? Well, I know in the media they have uh, been um, reports of a new vaccine coming out in September. Um, I would say that if you haven't had the vaccine in a while, um, at least four months, um, and especially if you have health conditions that um, increase your risk of um, getting complications from right. COVID, that you should get the vaccine that we have available. You right. mentioned there was a little uptick in COVID. Uh, who's getting hardest hit by COVID these days? And are there folks who should be more concerned than others? Um, that's a good question. With there being a variant, um, and uh, some people have not had the vaccine in a while and haven't had COVID in a while, I've seen across the board that people have uh, been infected all age groups. However, the most at risk are people that are immunocompromised. Those who have um, conditions that um, can make it uh, worse for them if they have complications. So you're already at risk anyway. What about the uh, masking and social distancing that we had to hear over and over again during the pandemic? What about now? Um, I think that they are still good ways to protect yourself and others from spread of disease. Right. Is it optional, masking optional now in most places like your office or whatever? Most places they are optional. Um, a lot of places may have their own policies like wearing a mask if you have symptoms, but yes, they're optional. I guess before time runs out, what I want to ask you about is, is something I hear about all the time, which is somebody starts getting symptoms of something, they feel bad. Well, it's hard to tell at first, is it COVID? Is it flu? Is it a bad cold? What's going on? What, what, what advice do you give to people about when they start feeling bad like that? That's a very good question too. Um, a lot of viral illnesses um, start off the same way. Um, the point is, is to really pay attention to how you're feeling um, and to consult your doctor if symptoms get worse. Um, if you have a positive COVID test at home, um, I really encourage to contact your doctor's office. Yeah. We have a few seconds left. I just, I'm curious, since you and I have never met until just now, who or what led you to a career in medicine? Was it a father, mother, aunt, uncle, teacher, <laughs> what? That is, <laughs> that is very funny. It was my parents. They're both in healthcare. Okay. And so um, I was always good in science and I love helping people. So it was a natural progression for me to go that's into medicine. That's just great. That's just great. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Up on screen, I'm going to put up this. Uh, NovantHealth.org is the general website. NovantHealth.org. And you can visit Dr. Jackson, Novant Health's Union Cross Family Medicine in Kernersville. Will you come back sometime? Absolutely. All right. We'll be right back.
Are you looking to jumpstart your future in the fast-paced, rapidly growing food industry? In Second Harvest Food Bank's Providence Culinary Training Program, you'll learn the craft and art of cooking, plus business and management skills, science and nutrition, and essential life skills. Providence Culinary Training has helped hundreds of individuals just like you launch successful culinary careers. There's no reason to wait to turn your passion for food into an exciting career. Check out the upcoming class schedule on our website at ProvidenceWS.org. Hi, I'm Jim Longworth, reminding you to catch my column, Longworth at Large, and Yes Weekly, every week. It's available throughout the triad, or you can go online, yesweekly.com. Back now on Triad Today, let's spend a few minutes talking about insurance and services for businesses. And we do that with two experts in the field. With me now, Joe Jessup and Eddie Nunez. They are both what we call trusted risk advisors with Alliance Insurance Services. And we welcome both of you. Good to see you. Good to Thank see you. you. Good to see I don't you. care who answers this, but I guess my obvious question before we get into the main topic is, what, what does that title mean, trusted risk advisor? Trusted risk advisor is someone who has industry leading knowledge to develop enterprise risk management programs. Essentially, that's really fancy for saying that we have meaningful conversations with business owners to develop, uh, to understand their business and the, uh, the problems that they face and to provide them with solutions. In other words, and not, and not just go into a business and say, well, here's my cookie cutter policy, you know, take it or leave it. You're, you're trying to get their input. And exactly, you have a sit down to really identify risk, evaluate the risk, and then craft special programs to uh, address those risks. I'll ask both of you this and start with Joe. What, who or what led you to a career wanting to have a career in, in insurance? I mean, it's a pretty complex field, especially these days. Was there somebody that suggested it or what? Yes, sir. Great question. Uh, it really started in my youth, growing up with my grandpa, being such an influencer and a pillar of our community. People came to him for advice, sought his opinion and input with their problems, their issues of the day, and right. of the, the times, and just watching him uh, reach and, and touch the community with that kind of support. The way he interacted with The them. way he interacted, uh, the high regard and, and the respect that he garnered in our community just really impacted my life. So uh, shortly after high school, I joined the service, retired from the United States Air Force after 20 years, right. uh, and just really enjoyed helping people, really enjoyed reaching out, you know, locally, globally, and helping people. Uh, the owner of our agency, Mr. Christopher Cook, saw that in me. You know, we're all from the same uh, area. Right. He saw that in me, thought that uh, once I got out, maybe worth having a conversation, a few conversations to pursue. And, and, it's, wor and it's worked out really well. I think that's interesting about, uh, about that. I, you know, Andy, what about you? What, what led you to it? I wanted to really serve my community, um, especially in the business sector. Insurance is often a very complicated and misunderstood financial tool, but it really helps protect business owners on their worst day. So just being an educator in that space is what brought me here, especially to the uh, Spanish speaking community that don't really have that resource. Now, uh, I want to ask you about uh, young entrepreneurs. Now, I mean, we've got a lot of big industry in the area, but let's focus on young entrepreneurs for a second. When you see them or talk to them or they come to you, uh, what, what do they need to know about getting business started up? You really got to know your numbers and understand your budget. What's your payroll? How much equipment do you have? What's your estimated projected revenue for a year? Having understanding of those items is what's going to help you be able to tailor a policy to make sure your business is properly protected and fits your needs. Uh, sadly, uh, especially in the formative stages of business planning, insurance is one of the things that comes last into a young business owner's mind. It's one of the first things they look to reduce when they go over budget. Yeah, because folks, look, I can tell you, if you don't have that settled early on, then it can be bad on the, on the back end if something happens. Speaking of something happening, of course, we had the pandemic. You work with hotel clients, other industries and what, and we sort of coming out of the pandemic. What, how did the industry, let's say hotel industry, for example, how does that change in insurance-wise? Yes, sir. We all experience the pandemic in our own lives and in our own ways. Uh, the hotel industry uh, saw a, a giant increase in property values, none that we were quite prepared for. So there was a conversation around possibly underinsured my building or my buildings of my hotel. Right. So of course, when you have that conversation and you increase value, coincidentally, the premium increases. Right. Uh, we love our properties to be, you know, highly valued, but yeah. that, 
premium conversation was a little bit tough to have. Especially in tough times like that. Absolutely. I just think that's interesting what you guys do in helping you know folks, businesses of all sizes. And I want you to come back because time is so short on these segments, but maybe you can come back sometime. We can talk more about some other industries, other types of businesses, the pitfalls and things that they run into. But I want to, before I forget, I want to put up on screen, myallianceinsurance.com is the website. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can visit that or give them a call to set up an appointment with two guys who I tell you right now are good listeners. So Joe and Eddie, thanks for all you do, guys. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Sir. Really appreciate right. it. We'll be right back after this. Every cookie sold in the Girl Scout cookie program helps girls learn lifelong lessons in people skills, decision making, money management, goal setting, and business ethics. It's amazing how much you can learn from a cookie. The Girl Scout Cookie Program. Think outside the box. Back now on Try Today, just about time for the round table, but another quick shout out to the good folks here at Senior Botanical Garden in Kernerville. Please visit the garden. You can also go online. You can rent the facility for weddings and receptions and luncheons, but it is beautiful out here. It's also beautiful right here because we have three beautiful people. I'm on the right, but always political left, Ogie Overman, great broadcaster and journalist, has some articles coming out, yes, weekly, I think this week and next. Rosemary Plymouth, former anchor of uh, WFNY TV, and Keith Granberry, founder of Helping Hands Consultants. All right, guys, let's get to it. School districts throughout the nation are facing shortages of bus drivers, including in Forsyth County. They're down 58 drivers. Up until 1988, high school students were allowed to drive school buses but the Labor Department changed that. Would you like to see teenagers once again be allowed to drive school buses? Ogie. I've vacillated a lot on this one, Jim. I, at first I thought, no, I don't think I do. But the more I thought about it, they, they did it before. And if you remember back then, there was this craze going around about school bus safety. They, they put the lights on top, the blinking lights, and it, they, they went a little overboard, and that's part of that. That's why yeah. it happened. So I'm okay right. with it. Roadmark. I'm okay with that. I had, my, I had a teenager drive my bus, and she was my babysitter. She was fabulous, and I think it's a great job for them. A absolutely. Keith? Absolutely. I think they should be. And I think recruit college students as well. Yeah. I didn't think about that. That's a good idea. Now, speaking of schools, a former magnet school teacher in Winston-Salem just pled guilty to helping a 14-year-old student possess a gun at school. Here's what happened. Each day, the teacher allowed the gun to be stored in the classroom. He'd bring it with him each day. And at the end of the day, she'd give it back to him. The teacher got off with a suspended six-month sentence. Should the punishment have been more severe, Ogie? I tried to think of a, some kind of extenuating circumstance that would make it okay. The kid might not have felt yeah, I mean, safe on the way home. It might have, have been bullying know. or domestic but situation, still. but still, no, she should have gotten a little bit of time. Rosemary. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about how much time she should have gotten, but I do think it's hard to believe how that how that seemed okay, and it went on for so long. Six months suspended sentence. I'm trying to understand her cognitive thinking. I mean, if he's in trouble, call the police or something, but to hide a gun for a 14 year old doesn't seem like it's, it's even sensible. Earlier this month, a 62 year old white woman was arrested for assaulting two black children, both under the age of 12. The children showed up as guests at an apartment complex pool in Greensboro. When the woman told them to leave, she threw a drink on the boy and hit him repeatedly in the face. Should the woman be charged with a hate crime instead of just uh, assault when she goes to trial? Oh, yeah. uh, I remember that. It was all over TV for a while and the lady did apologize and it seemed sincere. Hate crime, no, but I would like to see her get about 30 days. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know the, a legal mind for what determines a hate crime, but this it seems like some time and punishment and it is appropriate. Gee. Yeah, I, I think it's a hate crime. I think she's I think she's been like that. I think she was raised like that. I think and, and, and people like that, if they continue to do those things, if they did it to a a young person like that, who you, I mean, how many times do you think they did that before? She right. absolutely needs to be charged as a hate crime. All right, we'll see what happens because it still hasn't been resolved in trial. For the first time in six years, sales at Target stores dipped because of a gay pride month display that all the stores had. Now, the similar thing, as we know, happened with the Bud Light scenario with a, a trans person in their ad. In general, in general, should stores and products stay clear of controversial social topics like most of them trying to do away from politics? Just stay away from it, Ogie? No, I'm okay with stores. Uh, 
Like, I, it helps me know where to shop. Like, I don't shop at Home Depot, but I do shop, you know, I buy Ben and Jerry's ice cream all the time. Because of their stand yeah. on that. Yeah. Rosemary. Yeah, I think it's fine. I think, you know, you, you, you got to answer to your board, your shareholders, and, and, and your conscience. But and you know from you know from being on TV, though, you couldn't just get on the air and talk about your political beliefs. Right. Well, that's because, but if, 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 if I were the, if I was putting, if I were the owner of the station, I could, I guess. Right, right. It, it all depends on that. It, it's not the workers making the decision. It's the company making the decision. Gee, it's up to them. I, I think that um, companies should should always uh, be able to have a, a wide variety of people. So I, I think they're wrong in, in trying to boycott Target, absolutely. Republican legislators in Raleigh have prevailed and now gender affirming treatments will not be available to anyone under the age of 18. Now, regardless of how you stand on some of these issues, I mean, do you guys have a problem with making a kid wait until he's 18 to have surgery to change his gender? What's wrong with that technically, Ogie? I, I do now, Jim. I mean, the current research says that, that kids know that they identify with, with, with the opposite sex as early as five or six years old. Right, but having surgery before 18 Well, you know, what? maybe 12, 13, some kid should be able to yeah, do that. Yeah, the law isn't talking about surgery. It's just talking about any gender yeah, Any kind behavior. of treatment. And yeah. so I think treatment, yes. A surgery, that should be between, well, surgery and treatment should be between the doctor and the family and not our, not politicians. That's true. Yeah, Rosemary's correct. I mean, it's, it's all gender affirming treatments, mm -hmm. but surgery would be included. Right. So, uh, Keith, what do you think? I don't think no one should have surgery before 18 to change their, their gender. I, I think everyone should be able to identify with who they identify with, but surgery is a huge life altering decision that does not need to be made before you're 18. So treatments up to a certain age. But yeah, yeah. yeah, I okay. mean, but, but no, no surgery. No, no, no surgery, all right. Finally, a Clemson University food scientist says that blowing out candles on a birthday cake creates thousands of bacteria droplets on the icing. Guys and gals, do you eat birthday cake icing after it has been blown on? Probably a thousand times, Jim. Easy a thousand times. Rosemary? I mean, after COVID, I, we started to think about it. I give the kids a cupcake, blow on this, <laughs> and then we'll eat the cake. I mean, sorry. That's Keith, right. do you, uh, you eat icing that's been blown on? No, no, I, I, I definitely don't eat no icing that's been blown on. No, I do not. Well, you can get germs from a lot of things, like kissing. You kiss, don't you? Kissing and icing is two different things. <laughs> oh, you heard it here. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. I can't. All that icing is that's just yeah. terrible, Jim. Why kissing, are you trying to trick me? Kissing You're is trying different to trick from me, icing. Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so says Keith Granberry. <laughs> kissing is different from icing. All right. Finally, oh, that's all the time we have. Oh, except for this, a Miami suburb. The officials there said they had to do something with their Mayo peacock problem. They got to do something, so they f filed this full report that concluded that they'll give the peacocks vasectomies. This is a this is a true story. <laughs> now, opponents of the peacock vasectomy uh, program got mad and said, "Look, we want to see the full report because all you gave us so far is a snippet." To the so yeah, vasectomy. Yeah, yeah. That's what they said. That's like that icing joke. Yeah, for all of us to kiss icing. You can kiss my icing. We'll see you next week.